good afternoon, everyone. So, so today we'll introduce this part B of uh, our ASP. So this is the African School of Fundamental Physics and Application. So that's an online lecture series. And then I will introduce the biography of uh, our lecturers. So as introduced previously as well, so this ASP series aim at engaging further with large scale research infrastructure. So there are 10 specific lectures that have been presented and that are being recorded as well to describe the photon that the neutron in the quest to solve societal challenge. And hopefully as well to support the next African light source. So that was for the photon side. Now we speak today about neutron. So since uh, um, the beginning as well of May, the ASP community has uh, produced up to 60 different lectures in the field of theoretical physics, experimental physics and application. So all those precious recordings and the prerequisite as well that are needed are available on our website. Uh, and you will find as well more of those uh, interesting information about our nonprofit organization. So feel free to attend, I mean, to access this site and then to ask questions as well and contribution if you want. So today's lectures in following six presentations from Professor Andrew Harrison, so who introduced, I mean, end of last year, synchrotron and neutron based diffraction and spectroscopy technique. So now the coming four lecture will be given by experts from the European Spallation Source. And today, so we have the honor to listen to uh, Dr. Andrew Jackson. So Dr. Jackson has over 20 years experience in neutron scattering and has been using neutron to study problem ranging from fundamental physics, chemistry to applied food science since his undergraduate dissertation. So following obtaining his undergraduate and graduate degrees from the University of Oxford. So Andrew spent three years as a postdoc at the UNU in, Cam in uh, Canberra in Australia working on projects with the dairy and the mining industry. So then he moved to the US where he spent six years as a guest researcher in instrument scientist at the NIST, so the Center of Neutron Research in Gantos Bros in Maryland. So during that time, Andrew worked in a wide range of scientific and industrial problems, including composite, energy, material separation, food processing and geology. And in 2011, so Andrew moved to Sweden to develop the small scale scattering program for the ESS. And he's currently so the group leader for the instrument scientists and he's acting head of the neutron instrument division at ESS. So his current research interest lies in understanding the physical chemistry of self assembly in novel solvent development of new formulation media for pharmaceutical and studies of food structure. So for the logistic of this presentation, so Andrew can take the question as well during his presentation. So you can use the chat box or you can wave as well your hands so that I mean virtually so that we can ask him to answer during his presentation. So with uh, this uh, short introduction, then Andrew, so we can um, have you presenting so your slide and sharing the screen. And uh, we will put as well the slide in the website uh, in the coming uh, minutes. So Andrew, the floor is yours. Okay, uh, thanks very much, Christine. Uh, it's a pleasure to be able to uh, talk to you today about uh, neutrons uh, as a tool for uh, research, uh, and I use that in the broadest sense. Um, I'm going to be focusing today on talking about why we use neutrons uh, in, in various research fields, what types of research we can do using neutrons, how we produce neutrons, and a little bit about the European Installation Source and why we're building it. Um, so to give you some context, Christine all previously mentioned that this is part of uh, a series of four lectures um, being given by uh, people from uh, the uh, European Spallation Source, uh, starting with me today. Um, and then Pascal Dean uh, will be talking about how to use neutron scattering to understand uh, magnetic materials. Um, uh, Robin Woracek uh, will be talking about how uh, non destructive testing um, using neutrons, so uh, understanding the structure of engineering materials uh, and the like. Um, and then um, finally, Valentina Santoro will talk about uh, using neutrons to uh, study problems in fundamental physics. Um, so uh, 
let's begin with asking the question of why on earth would we use neutrons? Um, and the, the reason is that, that neutrons have some special properties that make them uh, uniquely suitable for uh, the study of uh, the structure and dynamics of, of uh, materials and matter. Um, neutrons are, of course, charge neutral. Uh, this means that they can be deeply penetrating uh, into materials. Um, and this allows us to look at um, what is happening uh, deep inside uh, real systems, uh, operating machinery, uh, inside uh, equipment that allows us to manipulate the environment uh, our sample is in. Uh, so example here is looking at hydrogen and water distribution in operating fuel cells. Um, a, uh, a key uh, advantage of neutrons is the fact that they have a magnetic moment. Uh, and this allows them to not only act as a probe of atomic structure, uh, but also as a probe of magnetic structure. Um, uh, for instance, in understanding how uh, superconductors and, and other magnetic phenomena function. Um, and so this is a topic that, that Pascal will go into in some detail in, in her uh, lecture. Um, and um, neutrons, unlike X-rays, are scattered from uh, the nucleus of materials. Um, and this turns out to mean that the, we have a particular sensitivity to light elements and also a variation of sensitivity with isotope. Uh, and I'll, I'll talk a little bit more about this in a minute, but this allows us, for instance, uh, to, to understand where uh, hydrogen atoms sit uh, in, for instance, uh, drug molecules or proteins. So uh, you had a series of lectures from uh, Andrew Harrison, uh, primarily on uh, photon sources, uh, looking at the use of uh, synchrotron X-rays, amongst other things. Um, so you'll know that, uh, that, that X-rays were first discovered by Wilhelm Röntgen uh, in 1895, uh, and he was awarded the first Nobel Prize for physics uh, for, for that discovery. Um, X-rays are electromagnetic radiation. Uh, they have no mass. Uh, they have no magnetic moment. Uh, and when we talk about the types of energies that we use for uh, material studies, um, then uh, we're looking at uh, energies on the range of 10 electron volts to 100 kilo electron volts, which equates to a wavelength on the order of a fraction of a nanometer to two hundreds of nanometers. Um, and the brightness of, of uh, photon sources to today ranges from order 10 to the 6 to 10 to the 20 um, uh, photons per uh, some units. Um, neutrons, on the other hand, uh, had been first predicted by Ernest Rutherford in 1920, and then were, uh, that uh, prediction was then confirmed when they were discovered by James Chadwick in 1923, uh, where he used a polonium source, uh, which interacted with a piece of beryllium uh, and some paraffin and produces trace in the cloud chamber, which uh, he showed uh, were a result of this uh, nuclear reaction between uh, the, the alpha particles and uh, beryllium, um, uh, producing carbon and some neutrons. And Chadwick also uh, got the Nobel Prize for uh, physics and the discovering the neutron. So if you want a Nobel Prize, finding fundamental particles seems to be a good way to go. Um, the um, neutron, uh, by contrast with uh, X-rays, is a particle. It has mass. Um, uh, it has a magnetic moment. It's spin half. Um, and in the the energies we use for material studies um, are on the order of um, uh, milli electron volts to electron volts. Um, so you can see already that that is a much lower energy than, uh, than, than the equivalent X-rays. And we can see that, that we have similar uh, range of wavelengths available to us uh, at those energies. Uh, and the brightness of neutron sources uh, is on the order of 10 to the 10 to 10 to the 14. Um, and I'll come back to this later when we talk about ESS, but uh, immediately you could look at that and say, well, that's good. They're about the same as... Um, uh, photon sources. However, um, I uh, brushed over the units previously, um, but you can see here that in the case of the photons, we were talking about per square millimeter, per second, per milliradian, uh, per narrow uh, wavelength bandwidth. 
Um, whereas for the neutrons, uh, we're talking about per square centimeter uh, per second, per steradian and uh, per angstrom of wavelength. And so in practice, um, the brightness of neutron sources is many orders of magnitude lower than that of uh, X-rays. Uh, however, um, brightness is not the, the key benefit uh, with neutrons. Uh, the key benefit here is the fact that uh, all of those things I, I told you at the beginning about their deep penetration, their magnetic moment, and their sensitivity to isotopes. And that's really the story you'll see unfold as we, we talk today, um, is about how we make use of those properties of neutrons uh, to be able to unravel uh, questions of uh, industrial and societal interest. So the other difference, and I alluded to this before, was the fact that X-rays uh, interact with the electron cloud of uh, an atom, whereas neutrons, uh, being charged neutral, uh, interact actually with the, with the nucleus and scatter from the nuclear potential. Um, uh, this means that uh, the, the two different probes uh, have different sensitivities and, and different um, responses to the materials we put in, in, uh, in uh, the beam. So on the left, we have uh, a plot showing uh, the neutron scattering length. Um, let me just put on my laser pointer. Oh, yeah. uh, we have the neutron scattering length um, uh, as a function of atomic number. And you can see here that it varies uh, somewhat randomly uh, across the periodic table. And if we look at the X-ray form factor uh, for electrons, then you can see that this is more or less just linear with atomic number. It's just going with the number of electrons that we have uh, in the atom. Uh, and what this means is that um, not only uh, do we have a greater sensitivity for these light elements, uh, with neutrons than we do with X-rays, um, but also that we can see here that, for instance, we have deuterium, uh, heavy hydrogen here, and hydrogen uh, down here, um, and that also some other element, hydrogen and some other elements have uh, negative scattering lengths. Um, and what this means, particularly in the case of hydrogen and deuterium, is that we can uh, chemically substitute one for the other and actually vary uh, the interaction of the neutron uh, with uh, that material. And we can see this over here on the right, um, where we have uh, a view of the total neutron cross-section or X-ray cross-section. Um, so this is effectively, you can think of this as how big the uh, atom uh, looks to the probe radiation. Um, and you can see, for instance, that hydrogen has a very large cross-section, um, deuterium has a smaller cross-section, um, and if we go through here, we can look at materials like aluminium and iron, where we have um, quite small uh, cross sections for aluminium for neutrons, whereas they're quite uh, large for X-rays. Um, and this manifests itself uh, in the fact that um, neutrons and X-rays give us uh, different views of, of the same thing. Um, so on the left, you can see a video going of a coffee pot boiling, a traditional Italian coffee pot made of uh, aluminium. And you'll see in the previous slide that uh, aluminium has a small cross section for, for neutrons and uh, thus ends up being more or less transparent. Um, whereas the water in the coffee pot has a lot of hydrogen in it. And that has a large cross section. And so that is uh, scattering the neutrons out of the way more than uh, the, uh, the aluminium and so is attenuating the beam. So this radiograph allows us to see inside the metallic object what is happening with the hydrogenous material inside. Um, and we can make use of the fact that we get different interactions by combining measurements from X-rays uh, and neutrons to get a complete picture of the uh, system that we're interested in. And again, here it's literally a picture uh, in the sense it's a radiograph and here we're looking with x-rays at an engine um, and you can see with the x-rays uh, we see primarily uh, the uh, metallic outer shell whereas with neutrons that is more transparent and we can see uh, the, uh, the through the aluminium outer shell and see the steel components inside and some of the plastic components and then in the middle we have an example of a rifle cartridge 
Um, here with the x-rays, of course, the lead and the copper and the brass uh, are very uh, non-transparent uh, to x-rays because they have a very large uh, atomic number. Uh, whereas actually for neutrons, they have quite uh, relatively low um, uh, cross sections and thus end up being uh, rather transparent to the neutrons due to that weak interaction. Uh, and we can see inside then the, the actual grains of gunpowder uh, within the structure. So by combining, as I say, x-rays and neutrons, uh, we get a better uh, picture of uh, our uh, sample system, uh, whatever we're interested in. So I mentioned the fact that um, isotopes uh, can have uh, different scattering lengths. Um, and that some scattering lengths are negative and some, and most are positive and some are negative. What this means is that we can actually vary um, what we call the scatter length density, which is uh, essentially uh, the equivalent of the refractive index uh, for neutrons. Um, so much as you can probably see that the uh, experiments where you uh, mix uh, various different types of oil and you can make a glass rod disappear, or you can make um, glass beads disappear by uh, mixing ethanol and water and adjusting the refractive index so that uh, it's the same between the solvent and the glass. We can do exactly the same thing uh, on the uh, nanoscale with neutrons. Um, and so here, what we usually do is we make use of uh, selective deuteration. So we replace hydrogen in our samples with deuterium. Um, and this allows us to vary the neutron refractive index such that uh, some parts of our sample are more visible than others, or we make them equivalent to each other. And so this allows us to highlight or hide parts of our structure and get a, a more in-depth uh, uh, information about it. And this is shown in a cartoon form here. Um, you can see that, uh, that Lola is uh, well contrast matched to her environment. Um, so when the neutron monster comes, uh, it only sees Harold, uh, who has a lot of contrast with his surroundings, uh, and eats him. Um, and uh, also, it's not just variation between uh, different contrasts with deuteration. Um, we can also uh, make use of, as I said before, x-rays and neutron measurements as two different contrasts looking at the same thing. Uh, and and they also jointly provide us with more information about our system. On a sort of more uh, practical level, um, this is how it, 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 it works more or less in reality. Um, here we can see um, a system that you can imagine perhaps is coated nanoparticles um, or emulsion droplets in solution where you have an emulsifier on the outside and oil inside. Um, and so we start with a system where we have solvent, maybe that's water, we have the nanoparticle or emulsion droplet that's blue, um, and then we have uh, our emulsifier or coating, uh, which is in red. Uh, and if we're just interested in what is the, the shape and size of the uh, interior part, be it the interior of the emulsion droplet or the nanoparticle, if we change the refractive index, neutron refractive index of our solvent from green to red, now all we can see is the interior part. If, however, we want to know more information, uh, get information about uh, that shell coating, uh, and maybe our signal is being too dominated by the scattering from the, the core, what we can do is we can make our solvent blue. Uh, and so now there is no contrast between the core and the, uh, so the nanoparticle or the emuls uh, emuls emulsified oil and the solvent. And all we see is the emulsifier or coating. Um, and this is um, a method by which we can make something that is uh, at least a first approximation chemically identical, um, but which has different uh, neutron refractive index. Um, this is particularly powerful uh, when we're thinking about uh, biological systems, um, of course, because uh, they contain a lot of hydrogen. Um, and here, if we look on the left, 
we have uh, the variation in neutron scattering density, essentially equivalent to the neutron refractive index. Um, and it varies from being slightly negative for water uh, to being uh, quite positive for heavy water. Uh, and by mixing uh, light water and heavy water in different ratios, uh, we can obtain uh, a scattering density anywhere on this uh, spectrum. Uh, and if we then look at some biological molecules, uh, we can say, okay, so, so if, for instance, we're interested in proteins, then they tend to be in this region. Uh, RNA and DNA sit at a slightly higher scattering density. Sugars and phospholipids are at slightly lower scattering density. Um, and so um, by uh, just taking the natural materials, already we can see that by varying our solvent, uh, we can highlight or hide uh, different components in a mixture, a biological mixture. If, however, then we turn to the fact and say, right, well, we can now uh, swap some of the hydrogen for deuterium, then we have a new range of scattering densities that are available to us and which can be manipulated uh, by uh, clever chemistry almost freely to have different degrees of this, um, uh, we can see that uh, we have uh, uh, values that are up now in this level. Um, and so by mixing um, deuterated, hydrogenated, varying the solvent, uh, we can get, um, we can look at uh, substructures within a greater structure. An example for this is, um, we might be interested in looking at um, uh, lipid, uh, sorry, membrane proteins, uh, proteins that uh, embed themselves in the lipid membranes of cells. Um, these are key uh, drug targets most of the time as they mediate transport uh, across the cell membranes. Um, um, but however, they're very difficult to crystallize because they're fundamentally hydrophobic. Uh, and want to mix with the hydrophobic water eating part of the oily part of the cell membrane. Um, and so in order to study them, what we have to do is we have to put them into an environment that allows them to uh, take up their native structure, but in a more ordered way so we can get information about them. And so often we will put them into a uh, meso phase, a sponge phase of lipids and surfactants, so detergents. Um, but what we don't want to study is that uh, structure. We want the proteins. And so what we can do with neutrons is we can make the support material uh, match the solvent. So then all we see now is the protein. So we can get information about the native protein structure um, in, a con with, in a more concentrated way than we would find naturally. Um, without, ha without seeing a signal from uh, the support that we've put them in. So that's a sort of very brief look at why we use neutrons. Uh, essentially, the, to go back to the first slide, they are uh, strongly penetrating. So we can look through materials, particularly metals. And uh, this allows us to uh, study um, things under more real world conditions because we could say put a piece of industrial processing equipment um, or a uh, control the temperature or the magnetic or electric field on a sample um, whilst being able to see through the equipment that we've put the, the thing we're interested in uh, into. Um, they have a magnetic moment um, so this allows us to study uh, magnetic phenomena and they have a, a light element and iso uh, isotope dependent, uh, uh, sensitivity to light elements and an isotope dependent uh, scattering uh, effects. Um, and so what this allows us to do is make use of the contrast variation methods I've talked about to uh, get in much more information about uh, the structure of materials that uh, contain uh, hydrogen. How do we actually go about that? Um, in practice, there are a wide range of different types of measurement we can make with neutrons. Uh, I mentioned earlier when we were talking about um, neutrons and x-rays that the energies that we 
uh, use um, with neutrons are much lower than those with, with X-rays. Um, and whilst the wavelengths are similar. Um, and the wavelengths that we use allow us to study uh, everything from uh, atomic resolution diffraction measurements um, all the way out to macroscopic imaging. Um, and that goes through small angle scattering, where we look at uh, nanometer scale materials in bulk, and reflectometry, where we look at the angstrom to nanometer structure of surfaces. Um, but the fact that the um, energy of those neutrons is low uh, means it is well matched to the motions of atoms and molecules. Um, and there is a good correlation between the energy uh, that we use to probe a given um, time scale of, of motion and the uh, wavelength that equates to that that gives us the structure. So this means that it allows us to study what we say is the geometry of motion. Um, so for instance, we can study uh, with the same wavelength of uh, our energy of neutrons, we get atomic structure and atomic vibrations. Uh, with the same wavelength and energy of neutrons, we get molecular structure and aggregate molecular structure using small angle scattering and we get molecular motion uh, using spin echo. So there is this natural correlation uh, that uh, gives us a very powerful uh, tool to look at not only uh, where the atoms and molecules are, but how they're moving. Um, and so in an ideal world, of course, we would have just one type of neutron instrument that did all of this, uh, but practically that isn't possible. And so we have a family of techniques um, both in space, so I mentioned the space uh, direction, but also uh, in time. So we can study everything from uh, the vibration, lattice vibrations in crystals, all the way out to motions of polymers and, and lipid membranes. Um, and all of these techniques have some equivalence in other fields. So for instance, in the structural realm, um, there is, of course, the X-ray equivalent of all of these methods. So we can do X-ray uh, imaging and tomography, X-ray uh, small angle scattering, X-ray reflectometry, X-ray diffraction. You've heard some about that from, from Andrew. Um, there's also equivalent NMR techniques that allow us to get structural information. And of course, microscopy methods uh, that probe similar length scales. Um, in the time domain, um, Neutrons have uh, not so many uh, uh, equivalent um, methods that provide such a broad access to um, uh, the motions uh, in materials. Um, there are some uh, X-ray spectroscopy techniques, inelastic X-ray scattering, uh, NMR, and so on, that uh, and, uh, photocorrelation spectroscopy that fit in somewhat in similar ranges. Um, as well as um, dynamic light scattering, which somewhat uh, can overlap with spin echo. Um, but uh, there's nowhere near the range and flexibility of access that you get with neutrons. So what do we use neutrons for? Um, if we look back in time, uh, neutrons, uh, the early days of neutrons were, were heavily dominated by uh, study of magnetic systems because they are such a unique probe of magnetic structure. Um, and, and this is really a, an absolute unique strength of, 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 of neutrons. Um, uh, that, that's where, we, where it started. But as uh, the, the availability of neutrons for research has grown, uh, so have the applications. Um, until now, we now have looking at inoperando in devices, some very complex interfaces, uh, charge and spin transport, uh, looking at the time domain uh, problems on, on the, um, uh, both on the dynamics length scale and the kinetics length scale, where we're looking at change over um, microseconds to seconds, and then uh, dynamics on, on the sub microsecond length scale, uh, time scale. Uh, we're looking at protein structure. Um, and in general, the application areas have broadened as the uh, number of researchers coming into using neutrons uh, has broadened. Um, 
And over time, the complexity uh, of many of these systems has increased. Um, uh, we less and less study completely model systems and, and try and move to studying uh, much more representative real, real world uh, systems. But you may ask, how on earth do we generate neutrons for experiments? Uh, there are fundamentally two types of neutron source that we use. Uh, one is uh, nuclear reactors, where nuclear fission is used uh, to uh, uh, release neutrons. Uh, we stick some holes in the side of the reactor, uh, let the neutrons out to the instruments around the outside. Um, and then there's spallation. Um, this is where we take a high energy pulsed proton beam and uh, bombard something that has a lot of neutrons in it. So usually some kind of heavy metal target. Um, and this uh, bombardment releases neutrons uh, amongst many other uh, types of particles, but it does release a lot of neutrons. Um, however, both of those uh, methods produce neutrons at much higher energies than are actually useful for those measurements. If we want to be able to do those, that um, uh, atomic to um, uh, molecular scale measurements and look at those dynamics, we need neutrons with uh, energies on the electron volt uh, rather than the mega electron volt, which is what is, is usually coming out of these uh, sources. And so we have to make use of what we call a moderator uh, to lower their energy. Uh, and here we make use of the fact that uh, hydrogen has a large cross section. Um, and you'll, uh, as, as you work through doing neutron scattering, uh, the, the cross section of hydrogen uh, uh, re reappears uh, everywhere since it is really uh, quite key to many of the techniques that, that we use. But basically we make use of the fact that uh, neutrons interact strongly with hydrogen uh, to take hydrogen materials like water, liquid hydrogen, uh, liquid deuterium, uh, solid methane, um, um, or even liquid methane, um, and, um, uh, and then uh, let the neutrons interact with those um, so that essentially we end up with then a uh, Boltzmann distribution of, uh, of energies that uh, reflect the energy distribution of the moderation material. Um, and so we generally speak about cold, thermal and hot sources at these types of uh, facilities. Uh, cold means that we're using liquid hydrogen or something similar um, with uh, where the temperatures are very low. And so we end up with uh, low energy neutrons coming out uh, with long wavelengths. Um, we then have thermal sources, and this is room temperature water. Um, and so you end up with um, uh, a distribution of energies uh, that are slightly higher than you get from the cold moderator and sit in the wavelength on the order of a few uh, angstrom. Uh, and then some places we have also have hot sources. Usually these are graphite heated up to high temperature. Um, and these allow us to produce uh, very short wavelength uh, neutrons uh, for atomic studies. Um, so there are neutron scattering facilities using both spallation and uh, reactors um, around the world. Um, we, there are um, on uh, uh, all uh, inhabited continents. Um, and, uh, but there is, as you can see, quite a strong cluster uh, within Europe. Uh, and Europe has a um, quite a long tradition uh, of, uh, of, of neutron scattering, um, but there is uh, increasing um, uh, expansion uh, outside, uh, outside Europe. And there are some uh, quite um, uh, uh, relatively older sources as well, such as ANSTO, which has been around since the 1960s uh, in Australia. Um, but you can see, so here in blue, are the ones that are uh, spallation sources, so we have uh, ESS here being built in southern Sweden. Uh, there's the ISIS neutron and muon source in uh, the UK. Uh, 
um, and the, the Paul Scher Institute uh, in Switzerland. Um, there's Oak Ridge National Lab in the US has the Spallation Neutron Source. Uh, and uh, recently in operation is the Chinese Spallation Neutron Source in Guangdong Province. Uh, and there is also uh, the J Park uh, MLF facility uh, in Japan. Um, the rest of the uh, facilities uh, are reactors. Um, you can see that uh, some of these have unfortunately recently shut down. 2019 saw the closure of the Helmholtz Center in Berlin and uh, the Orfei reactor at LLB in, in Saclay. Um, as well as the, the shuttering of the uh, Canadian uh, reactor. Um, and also, in fact, the, the closure of the user program, uh, the external user program at Los Alamos National Lab. They still maintain their spallation source, but it's uh, used for um, uh, defense uh, research only now. Um, however, there are uh, various still uh, well operational uh, reactors uh, and spallation sources with large user programs uh, and expanding uh, suites of instruments um, that, uh, that, that are open for business and uh, can be, uh, you can apply for beam time at these. Um, usually the way this works is you write a proposal for some number of time, amount of time on a specific instrument uh, to do a specific experiment, it's peer reviewed, uh, and then you're able to go and, and, and make your measurements. Just waiting for my slide to change. Um, not all uh, neutron sources are created equal, of course. There's been a progression over time in uh, the uh, brightness. I mean, I mentioned before the fact that neutron sources are generally of low brightness. Um, your typical neutron source is on the order of the same brightness uh, in neutrons as a old 60 watt incandescent bulb is in photons. Um, but, um, but we can see here on this plot uh, the fact that uh, reactors uh, increased in uh, brightness, uh, but have more or less been uh, steady uh, even in, in recent years. Um, and this is uh, primarily uh, due to the fundamental limitations of heat management in small reactor cores. Uh, in order to increase the brightness of a reactor, you have to increase the density of fuel elements. Um, and then the problem becomes removing the heat. Um, so you might say, you know, these are reactors, uh, our, our research reactors tend to be on the order of tens of megawatts in, in power. Uh, and you might think, well, uh, electrical power reactors are, you know, you have, we have gigawatt sized um, uh, power reactors. Uh, and the way they achieve that, of course, is that, that they want the heat uh, and they don't have dense cores. They have large core areas or multiple cores uh, and they use that heat to, to generate steam and drive turbines to produce electricity. Whereas for, for neutrons, if we do that, we don't actually increase the brightness that can be delivered to any given instrument. We may increase the total number of neutrons produced uh, and maybe that has potential to support more instruments, but the intrinsic brightness that can be delivered, the number of neutrons produced per uh, cubic centimeter um, uh, doesn't increase. Um, and we've reached some sort of fundamental engineering limit with that. Um, and this is where spallation sources can come in. Uh, we can, uh, because we produce so many more uh, neutrons per interaction, uh, with spallation sources, um, for the same heat load, we can uh, have higher brightness sources. Um, and so you can see that, uh, that, that uh, at some point, the, the brightness of spallation sources has overtaken that of reactors. Um, and um, here it is on a, on a, on a, a linear scale. Uh, because this shows uh, ESS uh, a lot higher than everybody else. Um, but you can see again here that, that this is uh, really the, the goal with ESS is the fact that we want to try and make uh, another step change in the brightness of neutron sources. 
So um, how are we doing that? Um, so ESS um, is, has a design uh, goal of uh, operating at five megawatts time average, which is equal to 125 megawatts uh, peak during a pulse. Um, we will have 14 pulses a second um, of protons hitting the target. Um, and uh, we will have what we call long pulses. Um, and this doesn't really make sense unless you're familiar with existing spallation sources, which now are called short pulse sources, since we're designing a long pulse source. Um, essentially, what this means is the fact that we uh, deliver our protons um, over a longer period of time. So on the order of 2.8 milliseconds, rather than, uh, let's say, 100 microseconds. Um, and what this means is that for uh, the same um, uh, peak brightness, we can deliver a higher integrated flux of neutrons for instruments that want that. Um, and then by increasing, by uh, coming up with a design for the target system that allows us to have much higher heat loads, um, we can increase the peak brightness when we're at full power of five megawatts, um, such that uh, we increase also uh, this peak value for uh, techniques that want uh, narrow uh, pulses. One of the other advantages is of a long pulse source is that if we want a short pulse source, we can make one. Uh, essentially, we can take this long pulse uh, and we can make use of devices called neutron choppers uh, that will select out short time uh, segments uh, of uh, that long pulse. So whereas with a short pulse source, you're stuck with that pulse length, uh, or you can make it shorter, um, here, what we can do is uh, we have a much broader range of uh, possible pulse lengths, which means that, uh, and the pulse length in general is uh, related to the resolution of an instrument's measurement. Um, what we can do is we can have instruments that don't uh, have to make a fixed choice in terms of, for instance, total flux versus resolution. They can operate in different modes where maybe they use a longer pulse, which is, a, which is usually a lower resolution measurement, but provides higher flux of neutrons, or they can switch uh, to a mode where they are running with narrower pulses, which gives them higher resolution, but of course, uh, then a, a lower uh, time averaged uh, flux of neutrons. And that means that the performance of the instrument can be tailored to the problem in question, which gives us a lot more flexibility than you find with a short pulse source. Um, we are on our way to uh, operating ESS. Um, we're currently uh, at the point where we now are starting to take over the buildings from the construction company and installing uh, the technical equipment for the accelerator and starting building the neutron instruments. And our current expectation is that we will be able to start the user program, hopefully in uh, 2023 to 2024, um, with uh, being complete with the construction in 2025. So I mentioned um, earlier the fact that there are a range of methods that we can use. And those methods require us to design specific instruments to, uh, to, to allow us to make those measurements. Um, and so in order to cover the full range of science that can be done with neutrons, we have to build a, a, a whole suite of instruments. Um, and the initial suite of instruments that we're building contains uh, 15 in total uh, with, a, with an eventual plan to reach 22 instruments. Um, there will be three instruments that will be ready for users uh, in 2024, and the 15 that we now have under construction will be ready in 2028. Um, and amongst that, we will have one imaging instrument, some small angle scattering instruments to look at uh, molecular structure, some reflectometer, two reflectometers to look at surface structure, five different types of spectrometers to look at that family of uh, dynamics that I mentioned and five different diffractometers to look at different aspects of uh, diffraction, uh, single crystal diffraction, protein diffraction, uh, powder diffraction, 
and things like engineering diffraction where you're looking at stresses in materials. And if you want to know more about the instruments that we're actually building, um, you can find the detailed information about them on our website, along with more information about neutron scattering in general. So I'm going to switch gears a bit now, having talked about why we use neutrons, how we produce neutrons, uh, why we're building ESS and, and, and what it looks like. Uh, to go through now a series of examples of the types of science that you can do with neutrons. Um, so if there are any questions on the first part of the lecture, now is probably a good time uh, to ask them. Any question? Don't be shy. Okay, if okay. not, I'm happy yeah. to, to, to take some later. Um, so the theme of this lecture series is addressing societal challenges and um, uh, neutron scattering uh, has had and can have uh, impact across a wide range of problems that are of direct relevance to the, the, the challenges we face in uh, energy usage, um, development of new materials, sustainability, um, health and aging, um, and, uh, and areas such as environment and the climate. Um, and uh, this is just a sort of uh, pictorial snapshot of the types of areas that, um, that we can uh, apply neutron scattering to. And I'm gonna talk now a little bit about some specific examples. So in terms of understanding uh, materials, um, a lot about material science and materials engineering is the question of how do we understand and predict the macroscopic behaviors, which of course is what uh, products made from those materials depend upon, uh, from the nanostructure uh, that we, uh, we generate as material scientists and chemists. Um, so an example here is looking at uh, understanding uh, stress and strain in uh, steels. Um, and this method can equally apply also to uh, other metallic uh, materials, alloys and, and the like. Um, and so this is uh, makes use of a, usually a combination of imaging and diffraction. And by using neutron diffraction uh, to look at what the interatomic spacing is and how that varies across the sample that has been strained, um, this can be a model sample like here, uh, or it can be real world samples, pieces of uh, uh, rail, uh, aeroplane components, um, turbine components, these types of things have all been put in neutron beams to look at uh, what has happened to them uh, during uh, their, uh, their operational lifetime in order to understand the causes of uh, and the failure mechanisms that, that can occur in those types of, of um, products. Um, so here you take a neutron beam and you raster it over the sample. Uh, you make uh, measurements of the diffraction pattern, um, a, a diffraction pattern in each of the each different area. Uh, you then calculate from that what the interatomic spacings are, and then you can make a map of uh, the, 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 the uh, strain field and calculate stresses. Um, we can also do a similar method uh, for looking at uh, polymer composites. Um, the, 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 most of the polymers and plastics that we use on a day-to-day -day basis um, are not purely a single uh, polymeric material. They are usually blends of polymers or they are polymers and polymer blends mixed with filler materials such as nanoparticles, clays, uh, carbon black, things like this um, that give them um, uh, different mechanical properties. Uh, the classic example of this is the uh, bumpers and plastic components on your, on your car. Uh, many of those have uh, different filler materials added to give them different combinations of rigidity and flexibility as needed for impact protection, for example. Um, and understanding the, uh, what happens to these materials on the 
uh, nanoscale. Uh, also understanding how the filler materials end up being distributed in these materials is something where we use small angle scattering uh, to study this. Uh, this is an example actually using small angle X-ray scattering, uh, but the equivalent measurements can also be done with, with small angle neutron scattering. And the key point here is again, we can put a sample um, under deformation cycles in the neutron beam uh, and look uh, and effectively in real time, what is happening to the um, uh, nanostructure or the molecular structure uh, as we apply uh, macroscopic deformations. Um, and this then allows us to develop uh, theories and models of, uh, of, of polymer interactions and uh, nanoparticle behavior that will help us design better materials in future. Um, moving to sustainable clean energy technologies is uh, a clear imperative um, uh, to combat the use of fossil fuels um, for uh, electricity production, one of the primary contributors to global warming. Um, and here there are a number of areas where uh, neutron and X-ray scattering um, can provide uh, key information in the development of devices. Um, uh, lithium is an element that is uh, neutrons are particularly sensitive to, uh, along with hydrogen. And so we can make use of that to get uh, information about uh, lithium ion batteries, how they, uh, the structure of the um, uh, electrolytes in the batteries is changing as we cycle them, and we can look at real operating uh, cells. Um, uh, I mean, the example here is, is using X-ray microtomography to look at dendrite growth, but we can also use, uh, but there they were limited by the fact that they had to use a lithium-lithium cell, but they couldn't use real um, uh, electrodes. Um, and so with neutrons, whilst we won't be getting the resolution that they got on the tomography front, we can use things like small angle scattering and diffraction uh, to look at how uh, the structure of the batteries is changing with uh, cycling uh, and operation. Um, organic solar cells are another area, uh, and the operation of these depends very strongly on the nanostructure of uh, the um, uh, polymer uh, region that is sandwiched between the electrodes. So here you have two polymers, uh, one is an electron acceptor, the other an electron donor uh, that uh, can interact with uh, the light uh, to uh, generate uh, current. Um, and this bulk heterojunction, as it's called, um, has to be uh, provide both uh, continu uh, continuous phases for both components so that there can be uh, effective charge uh, uh, movement, uh, but also the phases have to be intermixed that you have enough interface to be uh, to have a high efficiency. And uh, heat and heat cycling can have a big impact on the structure of that of those phases. And so we need to understand uh, how different processing methods and how different treatments uh, affect those structures in order to be able to develop better solar cells. Fuel cells, uh, another area where we can make use of hydrogen uh, to, uh, to generate electricity. Um, and here the key is in understanding the, the membranes, both in solid oxide fuel cells uh, and in polymer fuel cells that sit uh, uh, and act as the barrier for transport of uh, the ions across uh, the fuel cells. Um, speaking of the nanostructure organic solar cells, I mentioned that it's important to understand the question of uh, phase distribution. So here is an example of using a uh, grazing instance small angle scattering. Uh, so this is where you do small angle scattering, but you're looking only at the surface layer. Um, uh, so you bring in a beam and look only at the surface layer so we can get structural information about what's happening in the plane here. Um, but this allows us to look at the balance between, for instance, uh, crystallinity, phase separation, phase distribution, uh, again, using various different um, uh, combinations of components and processing uh, effects. Um, 
uh, organic LEDs. These are now in, in uh, all the uh, TVs and mobile phones and so on. Um, but again, these are devices where the performance of them depends upon uh, compartmentalization of the active layers. Um, and so what we see is that uh, if you have high operating temperatures, this can cause interdiffusion of the layers and uh, degradation of their performance. Um, and so this is an example where use was made of deuterium labeling of some of these different layers uh, so that uh, with time, it was possible uh, during uh, a heat cycle uh, to look at how these uh, different phases um, changed in size, how they diffused into one another um, in order to determine um, uh, what the um, uh, you know, maximum operating temperature should be for some of these devices to maintain their performance. Um, an example where um, we can use neutrons to uh, more effectively extract uh, oil and gas. Uh, and you know, this, you might say, well, this is sort of orthogonal to uh, the discussion I've had about sustainability and clean energy. But in practice, the, the um, more, uh, the better we can extract materials from when we do have to extract them, uh, the less damage overall the industry can do. Um, and so understanding uh, the structure of, for instance, shale gas deposits, shales, uh, and understanding how their uh, organic matter is distributed in them, um, and what their porosity is, what is the accessible porosity, and so on, um, are uh, areas where neutron and uh, X-ray tomography and small angle neutron scattering uh, can provide information not only about um, say pore size distribution, but also because of the chemical sensitivity we get from that isotope, that variation of scattering density, uh, it allows us to actually determine uh, where different parts uh, of the uh, system are, where it's rock, where it's uh, organic matter, where it's gas, where it's oil, and you know, areas that are uh, externally accessible, areas that are not externally accessible. Um, Another area where uh, we can um, uh, help uh, is in understanding the flow of complex fluids. And the example I've given here is for polymers. So, so when uh, polymers are injection molded, they have to be forced through uh, dyes in order to form the shapes uh, that, uh, that, that are wanted in the end. Um, and designing those dyes so that they offer the minimum resistance to uh, the flow of the polymers uh, can be key uh, in, in, for instance, uh, helping with the amount of energy usage in the plant and so on. Um, but also in, in a, it, it can affect the uh, uh, qualities of the final polymer product if the polymer itself has been strained uh, during uh, that injection. Uh, and so actually many of the theories of uh, polymer flow um, uh, have problems when uh, come to uh, sort of singularities in the, in, the, in the models when you have corners, uh, sharp corners and difficult uh, transitions. And so being able to measure what is actually happening to individual polymer molecules as they flow through these shapes can help inform the theory and help inform design of equipment in the long run. And so what was done here actually was a deuterated polymer was taken uh, as the bulk uh, and then a, it was doped in with the same uh, polymer, uh, but hydrogenated. And so effectively, what we could now see was a dilute solution of hydrogenated polymer and deuterated polymer. Now, they're all chemically essentially identical. So we're behaving uh, from, a, from a macroscopic perspective exactly the same as if they were all hydrogenated. But now the structure uh, of individual um, uh, molecules uh, could be determined uh, using small angle scattering uh, at different points uh, through this flow pattern. Um, another case where the chemical sensitivity of neutrons uh, can be uh, applied is uh, looking at uh, distribution, a chemical distribution of particulates. And this, in this case, it's looking at diesel filters. Um, so here, uh, neutron tomography was used to look at uh, the structure 
of a filter in place, uh, this device. Um, and what was possible to do was then uh, make use of chemical sensitivity of the neutrons to separate out the components of that structure, metallic components, ash, soot, and the actual monolith of the uh, diesel filter itself. Um, and so this is, uh, this is uh, yet another example where chem chemical sensitivity is key to uh, understanding how a real world device uh, can operate, making use also of the penetrating power of neutrons. Another area where we can apply neutron scattering methods is looking at questions within uh, agriculture and food. Um, uh, developing uh, antimicrobial, antifungal products um, in that are not um, uh, potentially uh, petrochemical derived or are not uh, damaging, environmentally damaging, um, means that uh, often we want to look at what does nature do. Um, and so here uh, the aim was to understand how naturally occurring plant defense proteins uh, actually interact with cell membranes um, so that potentially uh, we could then develop, uh, or we, that the, the researchers could develop um, uh, ideas about what alternative um, antifungal, antimicrobial compounds could be uh, designed or produced. Um, and here neutron reflectometry was used to take a model uh, lipid membrane um, and then attach uh, the protein to it and see how it interacted and disrupted uh, the, the membrane. And this is a big area of use of uh, neutron reflectometry actually to look at uh, the interaction of proteins with membranes. Uh, another area where um, this can be used is in understanding food processing. Um, so, for instance, optimizing the uh, processes for drying of fruit. Uh, here is the example I've used. Um, here, a model wind tunnel, as used uh, in real fruit drying, was set up. Um, and because water contains a lot of hydrogen, it was possible to look at the uh, changing uh, uh, transmission of the of the piece of fruit, I think it was pear in this case, um, uh, with time to see exactly how and where the water was uh, removing. And so this could be compared with mathematical models and, and design, equipment design. Uh, again, here, this was using uh, neutron tomography to help validate uh, mathematical models of the drying, in this case, apple, apple uh, was the sample in this case. Um, so understanding how um, uh, water transport occurs out of uh, uh, the fruit uh, body. Um, another example, uh, this was something that, that I was involved in, is looking at um, uh, using neutron scattering to help with the development of clean water technologies. So here we were trying to understand uh, natural flocculants. Um, so the, when you have uh, river water or uh, other well water that you want to uh, clean uh, in order to reuse it uh, or in order to use it, or if you want to recycle water, one of the first steps is uh, beyond bulk filtration is the removal, removal of uh, microscopic particulates. Um, and chemical flocculants are often used with this. I, you, have to generate a very high salt concentration or you add various polymers, uh, often fluoropolymers. Um, and these are uh, potentially either expensive or also harmful if released. Um, and so um, the goal here was looking for, to take the idea of using natural flocculants uh, and understand how they work uh, and to, um, uh, to, in order to be able to develop the efficiency of those further. So the seed pulp from Moringa olifera trees has long been used uh, to uh, clarify water. Um, uh, I mean, for centuries has been used to clarify water. Um, and uh, so, so undertaking this and trying to understand which are the components from the seed pulp that are actually doing the flocculation, um, what are the most effective ones, uh, and uh, how can perhaps seed pulp be processed in a way to make it more effective as a water uh, flocculant. Um, 
Some of this we chose to, to address using uh, neutron scattering. And we used small angle and ultra small angle neutron scattering uh, to look at uh, different components, but particularly the proteins uh, from Malingara olifera and some other um, species um, and see uh, how effective they were and what they did in terms of forming dense flocks or light flocks and so on, and what different conditions would lead to. The idea eventually being to help provide a low cost natural solution for water purification. Um, there was no macroscopic Mac, that's a typo, sorry about that. Um, another area is in studying uh, bio, in, in biotech and medicine. Um, for instance, um, uh, high cholesterol is a problem across much of the world. Um, and um, understanding exactly what's happening uh, with high density lipoprotein, how it interacts with cholesterol. Um, uh, here, contrast variation, small angle scattering was used to look at uh, the structure of the protein uh, with and without cholesterol and see uh, how, how that interaction occurs, which hopefully can then be used to develop ideas about how that can be disrupted and drugs that can help treat it. Uh, another area is specific drug target binding using uh, protein crystallography. Uh, here we can make the combination of X-ray uh, neutron studies. So we use X-rays to get a very high resolution atomic map but one that is missing where the hydrogen atoms are. Uh, and then we use neutron uh, protein uh, crystallography, which allows us, which gives us a slightly lower uh, resolution atomic map, but does very clearly tell us where the hydrogens are. And since um, hydrogen bonding is key to the uh, 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 effectiveness of many drugs and enzyme activity, uh, understanding exactly how uh, water is interacting and how drugs are uh, hydrogen bonding to the uh, molecules of interest uh, can be um, uh, absolutely key to developing new uh, treatments. Um, and in this case, it was looking at uh, a clinically used drug uh, with uh, a carbonic, interacting with carbonic anhydrase. Um, but similar uh, studies have been done studying the effectiveness of drugs, for instance, interacting uh, with uh, HIV. Um, another area where um, uh, of interest is in the development of uh, medical devices, things like um, um, uh, implants, prostheses, prostheses um, uh, joint uh, improvements for the elderly, and this type of thing. Uh, here, uh, uh, here is an example where uh, this is actually drug delivery. Um, and so the, this was looking at what happens when you ingest um, gelatin capsules. And soft gel products are very important to be able to get over-the-counter drug formulations to people. Uh, many of the, you know, if you take uh, an ibuprofen tablet, often they're in these soft uh, capsule forms. Um, however, the performance seems to vary widely across the globe due to different environmental conditions, different storage conditions. Uh, and um, uh, the, the company involved here wanted to understand um, what was actually happening uh, during the fracture. And so they used uh, small angle scattering again and some elasticity measurements uh, to look uh, at burst time uh, and correlate that with the structure of the gelatin gel. Uh, and this then allows them to develop new formulations to address uh, delivery in, in different uh, parts of the world in a more effective way than simply trial and error. So that was a set of examples, and I hope I've given you a, a, a very broad range of examples uh, of where industrial problems can be looked at uh, with, uh, with, with neutrons. Um, I've uh, stayed away from uh, questions uh, that are of uh, magnetism, because I know that Pascal will cover those in, in more depth um, uh, in the next lecture. Um, but fundamentally, what I would like you to take away from today is the fact that uh, we are able to generate beams of neutrons for uh, research. Uh, we can use them to study the structure and uh, dynamics of materials. Uh, they're a non-destructive uh, penetrating probe of structure. 
um, all the way from the atomic to the macroscopic scale. Um, we have a very valuable chemical sensitivity with a particular sensitivity to light elements that uh, means that um, neutrons lend themselves very well to studies in areas of uh, such as polymers, uh, biological molecules, and uh, clean energy technologies uh, like lithium ion batteries and um, uh, fuel cells and so on. Um, and that because neutron scattering can be isotope dependent, we can make use of these methods of contrast variation. Uh, swapping hydrogen for deuterium is the main example. Um, uh, and th but this allows us to use uh, the neutrons to study much more complex structures than would otherwise uh, be possible. So uh, thank you for listening. Uh, it's been a pleasure talking to you and um, I'm happy to have any questions. And um, if you come up with our thoughts after the lecture, um, then please get in touch with me. My email address is here. Um, if you want to hear me um, uh, waffling on uh, about a similar topic, uh, but with a particular material science bent and a little bit more about um, the production of neutrons, then there's, uh, there was, I was on a podcast episode from Materials from Sweden podcast a few years ago. Uh, which should still be up available on, on the web for you to listen to. So thank you very much. Wonderful presentation. Thanks a lot, Andrew. So I think it was, as you said, a very broad uh, list of application. And I think that this is the added value as well for this talk. So we saw in the earlier lecture, the different possibilities with neutron and X-ray. So this is very interesting, I think, for all of uh, our students, so whether they are postdoc, doctoral studies, or in their earlier time of picking maybe some topic. So you see there are a lot of topics that could be of valuable interest huh, for, your, for your thesis. So do we have any specific question, please? Huh? Perfect. So uh, metal. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Yeah. So there was a question about uh, is there any exception in metals that neutrons can't bend with you? Yes, uh, there are. Um, uh, so, so the uh, even the ones that uh, we can penetrate through, there are limitations, of course, to the thickness of those materials. So, so often we will have to; they have to be relatively, relatively uh, thin, even when uh, when you can penetrate them, um, simply because the the scattering adds up eventually. Um, but there are uh, some elements that are strongly uh, blocking of neutrons, gold, um, uh, 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 cobalt. Um, uh, I'm trying to think of some other specific examples. Um, tungsten is, uh, we use that. Uh, basically, the most of the heavy metals that you would think of tungsten, tantalum, uh, these type of things that we actually use as uh, our target materials um uh often uh, often have uh uh quite uh, uh high neutron absorption um by not neutron absorption but scatter strongly so that uh, that that the neutrons uh, uh don't penetrate through um but this 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 is this is easily calculable from the um uh the known scattering lengths uh, you can calculate the attenuation length of materials um relatively straightforwardly to understand what you're likely to be able to see through or not. And extremely important as well, the battery development and the improvement yeah. as well of uh, the quality of the battery performance. Okay, so... Um, Garima indeed has also some question. So there's a question, sorry, yeah. Yeah, yeah hi. hi, sir. So this is Garima here, PhD student at IIT Bombay. So my, my question is regarding, like you showed in slide 27 that we can actually see where are electron acceptor, electron donors. So is it possible to see them if there are defect clustering, like clustering of point defects? Like in iron oxide, we have clusters of iron interstitial and iron vacancies. So I'm interested in this type of study in copper oxide material. So All right, I see. So is it, is it a normal neutron scattering like we get uh, to theta to theta scattering in x-rays? So is it yes. like that or we can just picturize it 
like where are those clusters? Usually? Yeah, so yes, so so um, much as you can with uh, X-ray diffraction, you can measure similar things with neutron diffraction, but with different sensitivities. Um, and um, and so you can be um, you will be sensitive to different uh, different elements within uh, the material. I mean, iron, you said iron oxide or copper oxide. You're interested in what is that? Yeah, actually, there are a lot of studies in iron oxide regarding how they class, how they form a cluster of defects, like 13 defects come together and then yeah. form a cluster at particular temperature. So similar uh, thing we are seeing in copper oxide, but we do not have any particular uh, particular experimental technique to see that how these are forming. We just know from electrical data that there are clusters or DFT yeah. studies. Yeah, so so copper, unfortunately, is one of those elements that uh, is quite uh, blocking of neutrons. Um, oh. So, <laughs> but, uh, <laughs> but, but of course, one can, one can uh, uh, for, for neutron diffraction studies, one might have relatively thin samples anyway. So it's probably not, uh, not, not a showstopper. Um, but yes, absolutely. So, so I know uh, specifically, for instance, just in pure copper, uh, uh, the, the aggregation of defects along grain boundaries, for instance, and yes, void, yes. Void, void formation and things, they, that has yes. been studied using neutrons. Um, okay. So, so certainly I would expect it would be, would be something that you could use, use neutrons for. Okay, thank you, sir. Very good. And you have really thin layers as well, Garima. So I think indeed it would be good for the copper oxide. So there were a couple of questions in the chat, right? Yeah. So there was one about neutrons affecting biological systems. So, so this actually is something I didn't touch on, uh, but it's one of the reasons why uh, neutron reflectometry uh, and um, uh, neutron uh, protein diffraction are becoming increasingly popular is the fact that the very high brightness sources we have for X-rays do induce damage to biological systems because they're so high energy. Uh, because neutrons have low energy and are weakly interacting, they don't uh, impart significant um, heating to the sample. So you don't get the type of heat damage you get from x-rays. Um, there is small, uh, small amounts of, for instance, prompt gamma radiation can be produced if you have certain elements in your samples, uh, which may, uh, in very long measurements, be an issue. But generally speaking, uh, we treat um, uh, neutrons as being very kind to biological uh, systems. So if, in, in essence, they are a gentle probe and, and really have no effect on, on the, uh, uh, or no damaging effect on, on biological systems. So Rush, um, did you had a, um, a specific example, Ruska, just to make sure that indeed this is for Rushak, those type. Yeah. yeah. It's apparently it's okay. Yeah. yeah, yeah so then, and then um, Faisal. Faisal? You had a question about uh, depollution, using neutrons to remove radioactive uh, pollutants. Um, well, I mean, you could, uh, so, so using neutrons to understand materials that will sequester radioactive pollutants, I think is, is certainly an area that is, uh, has, has some potential. So whereas directly using the neutron beam to, to actually remove the pollutants is not something that's going to, going to work because again, all of the interactions are weak. They don't have a strong effect on, on, on the, the system under study. But certainly um, looking at uh, things like uh, the soil remediation, um, uh, chelation and sequestration of, of metallic elements, um, that, those are areas where neutron diffraction, neutron small angle scattering uh, certainly have um, uh, potential. Um, uh, for that type of, uh, of, of study. I uh, hope, that, hope that answered your question, Faisal. Uh, and Garima asked, um, where would be the best to study? Uh, so um, pretty much every neutron scattering facility will have a diffractometer, diffractometer that would, would allow you to do those studies. Um, so I think you have quite a lot of choice. Um, I don't know where you're based, um, uh, Garima. Um, India. In so I'm currently in India. Yes. Yeah. Okay. So, so, so the um, the neutron research facility in India, I believe, actually has a neutron diffractometer that uh, potentially would be suitable uh, for you to um, to work with, at least to do some preliminary studies. Um, 
the then I would suggest that um, uh, uh, being Indian, the uh, there is a good collaboration with the ISIS facility in the UK uh, with Indian researchers. Uh, I believe India actually is somehow a member at ISIS and contributes uh, somehow. So there's a there's a strong collaboration there. So that would be another potential uh, route for you. Um, generally, that the challenge is that whilst most facilities are fundamentally open to uh, everybody to some degree. Um, many of them allocate beam time uh, with some view to the countries that, that pay the bills. Um, and so, uh, so while science excellence leads, um, uh, often uh, the, the, the access you get will, will have some dependence on uh, where you're from and the, the funding stream you're following. Um, but, um, so, so if you can go to, to local facilities or ones where there are uh, already existing national collaborations, that, that definitely will, will help you. Help you. And indeed okay, can... sir. Okay, thank you. Very uh, good. So and indeed we can, we can collect as well and try to, to help to distribute because we had uh, with, uh, in September, we had as well a presentation from uh, BNL and same way there, so there was some possibility for the beam time, but through the DOE, yeah. it's a bit more complicated. So the European yeah. facilities are maybe a bit more flexible for that, even if they're coming from Africa or India. And in with this, the case of the safari, maybe, is there in Africa? So you, you have been as well a little bit involved with the program? Yes, so so so, so, so for powder diffraction, uh, safari is very good. You can do good, do good powder diffraction there. Um, I'm trying to, I think they have a triple axis instrument for, for, for some spectroscopy measurements as well. Um, but, but yes, definitely. I mean, uh, how was it? Andrew Venter runs the, um, diffraction program there and, um, uh, he is uh, very open to collaborations. Very good. And we have, uh, another question from, uh, from Shaka for the type of detector for the background yes well i could give a, i could probably give a whole lecture on neutron detectors but um but Would but in great? brief in brief i mean one of the challenge it's actually one of the challenges we face uh, is neutron detectors um i mentioned that neutrons are weakly interacting right and we say that is a great benefit uh but when you want to detect them you need them to be strongly interacting um and so thankfully there are a few elements that actually have large um absorption cross sections so undergo uh, nuclear interact nuclear reactions with with neutrons so we generally use um, uh, uh, helium uh, 3 um, or uh, boron 10 um, or uh, uh, lithium um, and um, there in those are different so so we will use gases helium 3 so the neutron will interact with that uh, produce charged particle uh, and then that uh, can produce a charge cloud in a gas, which we can then detect with a, uh, a charge collecting wire. Um, in the case of uh, boron, again, the neutron interacts with the boron, uh, produces a charged particle, um, or which we can then produce a charge, uh, produce a charge cloud, uh, which we detect on a wire. Um, in the case of lithium, uh, usually those are used in what well, in scintillation detectors. So we use the, uh, the interaction with lithium. Uh, we'll use something like lithium with a zinc sulfide in a glass. Um, and then uh, the zinc sulfide will produce light, which we can then collect with optic fibers. Uh, so where the neutron hits the, uh, the glass, we produce a burst of light, which is essentially the amplification point rather than the char charge cloud production. Uh, and then we can measure that light output. Um, but producing neutron detectors is 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 one of uh, the biggest challenges of building neutron instruments, actually. I think Does it's- Does that uh, give, you, give you enough of a flavor of them? I think so, <laughs> it's really good. And the limitation as well are different between the SNS and then the ESS to show how much capacity- Right, so, would have. Yeah, so, so one of the challenges we face is actually, um, uh, ironically, um, the fact that I said that neutron sources are relatively low in brightness, um, but actually we are already at the point where many of these detector technologies are easily saturated by existing sources. So we are actually having to develop, as part of the ESS development, we've been developing new detectors that allow us to, to measure at much higher count rates. Um, 
and this has been part of a wide collaboration across many facilities actually um, so so ironically uh, even though neutrons are uh, neutron sources aren't very bright compared to photon sources uh, we still can't easily count all the neutrons so. yeah so that would be uh, the next challenge to get the better performance so any more question on some of those topics? And this is a good idea indeed to have a further lecture about detector. I like the idea as well. <laughs> yes. Well, I, you know, if, if, if there's an interest at some point about neutron, I talk about more detail about neutron instrumentation, I'm happy to, to do that sort of thing as well. Very good. And as well to give some information from maybe from the, the website that uh, we have developed. I think yes, it might exactly, be yes. quite some as well yeah. available. Yeah, there's quite a lot there, yes. So very interesting question as well. So for the, the neutron diffraction that can be used for energy storage technology. Yes, absolutely. So, so there are a number of different areas where neutron diffraction actually already has been used extensively in, in understanding energy storage. So uh, the classical case, of course, is, is hydrogen storage um, and the study of metal organic frameworks um, where neutron diffraction has played a key role uh, in understanding how uh, the hydrogen itself is binding um, the strength of binding, the locations of binding within those 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 materials that are used for hydrogen storage. Um, in terms of batteries, I mentioned lithium ion batteries, um, but also things like uh, molten salt batteries. There is there's a lot of interest in those for large scale storage, um, and and there's there's some work I know of that um, uh, where people have started using neutron techniques to to look at what's happening uh inside um those type of of energy storage devices so so absolutely i mean particularly i mean so neutron radiography um has been used to look at the migration of lithium within real lithium batteries i mean you take a standard lithium battery and put it in the neutron beam and look at where the lithium's going um, um so so yes absolutely it can be used to study energy uh, storage technologies. And the case of cobalt as well within those batteries. Right, the yes, batteries and from, the case of cobalt From what well, you exactly, said yeah. before. Mm -hmm. Yes, yeah, yeah. yeah. Very good. So very good. So Emmanuel, yeah, indeed. Yeah. Massive materials. Uh, depends upon massive. So, and depends upon the energy. It's a, it's a very depends question. Um, so many of the neutrons that we're not interested in the high energy ones merrily penetrate lots of things, which is why we end up building lots of shielding around our sources. Um, but the thermal and cold neutrons we have um, in general um, won't be penetrating more than uh, a few centimeters of, uh, of metallic materials in a, in a good case. Um, so uh, it depends, depends what you mean by, by massive. So Emmanuel, is there any quantification? The type ah, of material yes. or the thickness? Yes, oh, so, yeah. so, so radiography, quality control of products, yes. So, so actually, uh, so, so, so one area that is used, uh, neutron radiography is used in, uh, for instance, quality control of reactor fuel elements, things that are very, I mean, it's not a high throughput technique, right? Um, but, but where there are high value items where you really want to check for, to make sure there are no uh, internal damage, cracks, this type of things, things are properly assembled, then neutron radiography uh, that can be used for, the, for, for some of those types of, of, of examples. Um, I mean, you're not going to, you know, look inside a 20 ton block of granite or something like this. Um, but if you're talking about um, doing uh, quality checks on the internals of a complex piece of assembled equipment, um, then, then certainly that's that's something that could be could be thought about. Oh, very interesting question from. Uh, I like it. <laughs> yes. Yeah, so, so, um, so there are a number of ways at the moment that we're looking at applying uh, AI and machine learning uh, in in neutron scattering. Um, so the uh, one area is actually in controlling the um, proton beam. So controlling the accelerator. So, so looking at using uh, machine learning algorithms to provide higher reliability than human operators. Um, there's a classic, uh, you know, 
uh, shift change issue whenever you have run these type of facilities where the incoming person uh, feels the uh, desire to just make sure it's just right. Um, and um, and so, so uh, having um, uh, a least machine guided, if not machine con uh, learning controlled um, uh, uh, operation of, of accelerators potentially uh, could provide higher reliability of operations. Um, similarly, in understanding diagnostic output, many of the pieces of equipment we have where we, we have diagnostic, diagnostic sensors on them to try and do failure prediction, for instance. Uh, uh, so, so there you have a lot of information coming out uh, and using machine learning methods to uh, synthesize that information and make, uh, make forward predictions about uh, lifespan and failures. Uh, so that, but those are really areas of operation of facility production in the neutrons. Um, there are also areas where we are looking at uh, both at ESS and other places at um, using uh, machine learning methods for experimental control. So, so taking information in a uh, uh, logical feedback loop effectively saying, okay, we've made a measurement we do some analysis that is uh, again, machine learning driven on the data that's collected that perhaps provides some quality metric, which is then feeding back into uh, how we should then change the experimental conditions. Um, things like large parameter space scans can be very inefficient. Um, so providing a machine learning algorithm with known information about the system uh, to design parameter scans that are more efficient through the parameter space, for instance, is another area uh, that, that I think has potential. So, and then, and then in the final data analysis, once you have collected lots and lots of data sets, rather than having a graduate student spend their rest of their PhD wading through it all, um, maybe it's better to, have, uh, to, to use the knowledge of the student to train a neural network that can then go through the data and pull, pull out the interesting parts. Um, so I, there's, there's, there's a lot of work going on to, to make more effective use of the neutrons that we have, right? Again, it comes back to the fact we, we don't produce very intense beams of neutrons. So we need to get maximum value out of them. And I think there is a, a lot of areas where uh, machine learning can, can be applied um, very effectively to, to, to deliver more efficient use of the neutrons that we have. Yeah, that's an excellent future as well for combining those type of uh, high technology. Mm. Excellent. And big data as well. Now. So for any trigger to improve the, the beam yeah, time. Exactly. And, and that's, that's, that's sort of the, um, I mean, we're spending a lot of effort at ESS on uh, putting together um, uh, data sets that have rich metadata so that machine learning algorithms have something to work on, um, right? So that so they have the initial information that, that's needed to, to, to make them effective. Um, Neutron reflectometry for fighting pollution. Yes, absolutely. Um, so um, there are a number of uh, ways one can use. I mean, uh, in for instance, so so first of all, in in detecting and quantifying uh, pollution, often we use uh, sensor need to develop new sensor systems um, that. Uh, depend upon the interaction of the pollutant with this, with something at the surface. And then neutron reflectometry can have a, a good role to play in understanding the interaction of pollutants uh, with surfaces. Um, it can be used to understand uh, in terms of producing sensors. Uh, it can also be used in terms of understanding the effects of pollution on things that we have, on stone, on plastics, on uh, on biological systems, um, for instance, looking at uh, the, the effect of, of high ozone concentrations on biological membranes is one area that I know has been looked at. Um, so, so from that perspective, using neutron reflectometry as a tool to understand what the effects of pollution are, how we can measure pollution, uh, and, um, uh, and then how we can, uh, so, so we can best focus our efforts on the right areas. Uh, I think it's absolutely an area that can be used. Also, again, I mentioned things like uh, soil remediation, um, so ground pollution, um, the question of flocculants, again, removing waterborne pollution, 
um, nanoplastics and nanomaterials that get into the water stream. Uh, understanding all of these types of interactions uh, are areas where neutron scattering can and has been has been used to help help build our understanding of the effects of pollution and the mechanisms mm -hmm. by which they, they act. Okay, very good. So, any more questions, huh? or do we call it for hand? Because it's a lot of extra time as well, maybe from your schedule. So sorry, it's, it's well, really I, nice. I, I, really I can nice. happily talk about this stuff for hours. So. And indeed, <laughs> I, I added as well your, your email address on the website so yeah, that if they absolutely. can and they could contact you directly, the, the slides as well as there. So the PDF, it's, it's okay. And the, the PowerPoint, we can keep, if we can keep both, that would be good because indeed you have little movie. So it's a 40 yeah. megabyte, but it, I managed to, to upload it. <laughs> and if there are further questions, or indeed for the the next uh, four weeks, or the next uh, I mean three now uh, Tuesday, so we'll have possibility as well to to speak to the same type of uh, of yeah. expert at ESS. And next, so we'll be Pascal. So I think it would be also very good to to look at uh, the focus on what the magnetism, because magnetism was as well one of the topics during those different. Uh, lectures that uh, were coming back from the maybe more high energy point of view, high energy yes. or fundamental physics point of view, but this is really good to look at the phenomenology as she will present. Huh? Yep. Okay, so, so thank you then everybody. And if uh, there is no more or further questions, so happy new year again. So I think it was a great start, Andrew. Thanks a lot for enlightening us for all of that. To Thank unlight you very much. It's a pleasure. Neutron, only photon, not only photon can unlight, we can discover that. So, <laughs> French joke. Uh, no, in English, sorry. But so, thanks. <laughs> <laughs> International, let's say. So, it's really good as well to see the, the, the dynamism huh? so, and to have all the continent gathered. So, I think it's a, a really an added value for all of us. So. And you see there are a lot of. Uh, uh, I mean, you, you have to be aware as well that some of the people cannot really share because of the, the limited broadband as well. That yeah, I know, I understand. I completely understand that. Yes, yeah. yeah. We often That's had good. this problem, but you see, so they can, they, you see from all of that that they greatly appreciate it. Huh? And thanks a lot as well, Saka. Yeah. Excellent. Super. So then we'll meet uh, next time and uh, next Tuesday for more episode on uh, the life of Neutron. Uh, Excellent. <laughs> Thank you, everybody. And it will all be recorded. And tonight I should be able to upload it on the YouTube again. And see you soon. Bye, everybody. Bye. Pleasure. Thanks. Bye-bye. Bye, everybody. Bye, Garima. <laughs>